I'm Peter Collins. I uh, graduated from Georgetown University in 1969, got drafted the next day. I decided I'd rather fly airplanes. I had an uncle who'd been in the Air Force and he had sent me brochures about jet fighters with afterburners running. I always thought that was great and I wanted to do it. So I went to pilot training in Del Rio, Texas, got to uh, go to F-100 schools at Luke. I was in the Air Force's last F-100 school, which was marvelous because the airplanes were in great shape. The instructors were all heading off to other assignments and they didn't really care, so they were pretty aggressive and we had a great time. Day after graduation from F-100 school, when Barry Goldwater came and, and gave us the final blessing, uh, day after graduation from F-100 school, we got orders to go to Saigon in the O2, a little Cessna 337, which is a push-pull Cessna basically about the same size as a, F, as a Cessna 182. We didn't like that assignment at all. We were fighter pilots. We didn't want to be fax, forward air controllers. But we put up with it. We went to Hurlburt Field in Florida, learned how to fly the O2, how to put in an airstrike from a slow moving airplane, and went to Vietnam. I got to Vietnam in February of, 2000, of 1972 which was very benign at that point. Most of the Americans had been withdrawn. The only Americans in the field were uh, army advisors to the uh, uh, Vietnamese army and the Vietnamese rangers. And there were maybe one advisor for a, a 500 person uh, unit. So it was very limited and there were only command and control people. And it was very quiet. There was no indication that it was gonna be an attack. And so we'd fly two guys in an airplane and we just, go out, fly for three hours, and then come back because there was nothing going on, nobody giving us threats, nobody shooting at us, nothing at all. So we thought this was pretty benign stuff. April 15th, I believe it was, was the day of the first uh, assault of the second Tet invasion. Tet is a religious holiday in Vietnam, and they launched the first Tet in 1968 on that date, and they launched the second Tet in 1972 on that same date. They, this time they brought 300,000 men and 700 Soviet T-54 and T-62 tanks trying to take Saigon. They also hit the, the Central Highlands, but they took a significant force through Cambodia and down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and came in from the west side of Vietnam and attacked Lac Ninh, which fell while I was above it. Uh, a guy on the ground named Zippo, who was a very brave uh, uh, advisor to the Vietnamese, was on the radio with me uh, at the end of the day and I told him, Zippo will be back in the morning. And he said, no you won't, I'm going out the back door. So Loch Ninh fell. It was a provincial and religious capital. About 10 miles further south on, this, on a major highway was a town called An Loch. And about a week later, and I, I had participated in rescue of people up and down the highway between the two, uh, put in a lot of strikes around Loch Ninh but not in it. Um, after that, about a week later, uh, the North Vietnamese started bombarding An Loc, which was a town about three quarters of a mile square at the most. Um, at one time had about 90,000 inhab 90, inhabitants, uh, not anymore, uh, although probably now, 50 years later. Um, but An Loc became this place where the South Vietnamese government decided to take a stand and to fight the, the North Vietnamese and keep them from coming down that major highway which led directly to Saigon. Uh, the North Vietnamese Rangers were mostly in the city and did a lot of good work. Uh, there were B-52 raids all around the city on a nonstop basis over a five month period. And we put a whole lot of facts and a whole lot of airplanes and a whole lot of airstrikes in and around Anlok. And we eventually got most of the tanks, I think all of them, uh, that were in that area and all of the bad guys. Um, we, uh, we were flying, originally we were flying at about 3,500 feet and we'd roll in. We had two rocket pods about that big around with seven 2.75 inch rockets each. The rockets wouldn't hurt anybody but they put out a plume of white phosphorus smoke about 20 feet across which gave the fighter pilots a target to shoot and to drop their bombs. And we'd shoot the rocket and then pull off and then watch the rocket and then give a correction off of where the rocket landed for exactly where we wanted their bombs to hit. And we'd know that because we were talking to the, the ground commanders on the ground on FM radio 
we were talking to the controllers back in Saigon and Benoit on VHF radio, which is medium range, and we're talking to the fighters on UHF radio or ultimate, ultimate ultra high frequency radios. So that's how we kept it straight. So we have three radios. We're flying the airplane, we're putting in rockets, we're talking to the people on the ground who frequently are screaming because they have people coming through the wire at them. And we would make these uh, marks for the targets and then the fighters would come in and strike. And how old were you at this time? I was 23, I was 24. Um, and uh, we were uh, confronted in the very beginning with heat seeking missiles for the very first time. The first day of serious combat, we lost seven airplanes two forward air controllers, a C-123, a C, uh, an A-37, and I believe an F-4. It was a, a nightmare. And the heat-seeking missiles for the first time caused a huge problem for forward air controllers because they had uh, re regular um, continental engines that created a lot of heat and produced a perfect infrared trail for the uh, heat-seeking missiles. And they went up to about 8,000 feet before they became ineffective. So we, with all these losses in the very beginning, we had to move our air altitudes up to 8,000 feet, which created a real problem. Um, but we, uh, we ended up, I ended up flying 267 sorties in one year in Vietnam, all combat sorties, and 896 hours of combat time. I don't know how many airstrikes I put in, but I'd estimate it's about 1,500. And these were F-4s, these were A-37s, these were uh, A-7s from the Navy, later on A-7s from the Air Force, even an, F, uh, an F-8 group came in one time and we put in a lot of A-6 strikes as well. Um, there's one episode, if you don't mind, I'll tell you about, yeah, let's, yeah, let's uh, talk about this. Uh, Pep McPhillips, who was a Sundog fac, I was a rash fac. We were, we were fighter qualified and therefore we could put in strikes for the U.S. Army. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the other guys, the sun dogs were not, but they were good guys and good facts. And um, Pep McPhillips was putting in a strike one day about a, a mile west, I'm sorry, east of Anlock and got shot down by a heat seeking missile. I was directly above him because we were putting in three strikes simultaneously over Anlock. And the day the Tet invasion started, the bad guys blew up all the radio control facilities, both at Tay Ninh and at, Lock, and at uh, Benoit. As a result, we were the controlling force over the airspace. The same thing happened, by the way, in 2002 in, in the Anaconda strikes in Afghanistan. Exactly the same thing. And if you talk to Soup Campbell, you'll hear almost the same story. And it's a great story about how he had to declare the airspace his, and he had to put people at different altitudes and everything else. That's exactly what we did in 1972 in ANLOC, because we were the controlling authority. So fighters would come on board and we would assign them specific altitudes and we decided eventually to put one fact up high as the king fact. The other facts were down below. Remember this is less than a mile square. We were coordinating these strikes all the time because the bad guys were so close on the wire on four sides. So we were putting in strikes constantly. We, the king fact would bring a, a fighter down and assign him to one fact or the other, give them a different frequency and go do their work. Well, Pep got shot down below me and um, so I dropped down to, to mark for him and to try to protect him and guide him to where the good guys were. Good guys were coming from the southeast, the bad guys were coming from the north trying to take him because they'd seen the parachute. As he hit the ground, he popped a smoke, which you're not supposed to do. And so the bad guys started towards him immediately and they, as a tactical move, they popped two more smokes to confuse people, which did. I have two F-8s who are airplanes that are made for air-to-air -air fighting and not made for air-to-ground, and they have guns on board. They also have two 500-pound bombs each, and they really desperately wanted to help. Their call sign was Nickel 5-5, and they rolled in on the, t on the smokes and said, okay, Rash, we got him, we got him, are we cleared? And I said, no, go away. <laughs> One of those is our guy. Well, we ended up, they, they were helpful because they ended up forcing the bad guys to back up and about that time, the good guys came from underneath and got Pep and took him back into Anlock. Okay. Anlock was so intense, we couldn't get him out for almost two weeks until a helicopter was finally able to bring him out. Well, Anlock finally ended up, we ended up, uh, and there's one other episode, if you don't mind my telling no, you a story. Please, yes. uh, there was, at one point early on, the, uh, 
the North Vietnamese thought that An Loc had surrendered. I don't know why that happened or how, but it's been documented a couple different places where I've read about it. And their tanks rolled into downtown An Loc. One source says there were only six tanks there. My recollection was there were more like 20. And we got the first tank and we got the last tank and the, the Vietnamese Rangers using tow missiles made here in Tucson by, by uh, Hughes Aircraft got all the rest of them. It was a great day because it really turned the tide for a lot of things. Um, we, were, uh, we were getting secondary explosions every time we put in strikes all around Anlock from the bad guy. Um, so anyway, um, I finished the tour there. Um, they had me and John Chambers, an F-16 squadron commander later on, uh, extended our tour so we could fly on the ceasefire day as a show of force. We had no rockets, we had no artillery available, we had no fighters available, but we were a show of force with two O2s flying around Saigon. We got shot at like we did every other day, but that was not a big deal. And uh, anyway, we got home. I applied right away and I went to the Air National Guard, got back into the F-100, which is a great airplane, the first airplane to go supersonic and level flight, and a great airplane and a lot of fun to fly. I was in the Ohio Air National Guard, a great unit in Columbus, Ohio, the 166th. We flew that for about a year and a half, and then we transitioned to the A-7, which was a bomb-dropping, slower airplane uh, with a computer on board that was extremely accurate and uh, a great airplane, really. I ended up flying, uh, I think, about 2,000 hours, maybe 2,500 hours in the A-7 with never had an engine failure. I had a couple of lips every once in a while, but never had an engine failure. Never in my career had to jump out of an airplane, uh, except helicopters and training, right? Yeah. Good news, good news. Um, the A-7 was a great stable airplane. We trained on 48-hour call to go to the Middle East and other places, and we were uh, one of the two best Air National Guard squadrons in the A-7, along with the Albuquerque unit. Yeah. Relied upon by 9th Air Force to take the lead on a lot of these bigger profile missions, which we did. It was a great time. Great group of people. Great thing about the Air National Guard, when I left Columbus after 13 years, there were 11 pilots there who had been in the squadron longer than I had. So the continuity of the Air National Guard was the selling point to Ninth Air Force for the bigger missions, and it's a real deal. It makes a difference. I, uh, while I was in Columbus, I went to law school at Ohio State University, the School of Law. Graduated from there, became a prosecutor, uh, was a prosecutor, tried a whole lot of jury trials early on on fairly simple but some significant cases. Uh, went out into private practice and was there for five or six years practicing on different things, commercial and other things. Then in 86, I had a great opportunity. I came out to uh, Tucson, Arizona to be the A-7 op uh, officer for the Air National Guard Test Center, which back then was called the Fighter Weapons Office. We were putting new equipment on old airplanes to make them more relevant to the war fighters and putting them on in very short order and doing them quickly and making them work. We had our own engineers, we had our own mechanics, we had our own uh, facilities and uh, software particularly. So it was a great, great opportunity. And uh, in that role, I ended up being the night attack manager for the Air National Guard. Um, there were lots of people working on it, but I was just one of the primary guys. We put night vision goggles in Air Force fighters for the first time. The Air Force didn't believe in it, or they had other options or other, other things they wanted to do, such as lantern. But we all thought that it was a better idea to have the ability to look out to the side and see what the terrain was like when you're also looking through the soda straw of an infrared device. Yes. And, so, <laughs> and so we, uh, we did that. We did demonstration rides for a lot of, a lot of Ninth Air Force people and a lot of Air, the Air Force fighter pilot doctor, which was uh, a mixed blessing. I get, took this guy for a ride, and he was a nice guy, rode my back seat, showed him what the good news was with the goggles out to the side, and he was an F-15 pilot. Three months later, he was in Desert Storm, and he got killed running away from an SA-2 when he ran into a mountain. Been wearing goggles, that had never happened. Never happened. So, Anyway, we ended up uh, using GEC, uh, uh, Generation 3 goggles, which are binocular. And they were small apertures, but they were great. You could see most of everything you wanted to see. Yeah. Um, I then uh, finished my four years at the test center. I was the, pro I was the project manager for something called Low Altitude Night Attack, which was the A-7 version of the uh, Air Force's Lantern. 
It was a it was a good program. It was not great, but it was it had flaws and it had navigational issues, but it worked, and uh, it was a good program. But the wings started cracking on the A7s, so that was the end of the A7, yeah. and we couldn't carry wing, we couldn't carry pods, couldn't car carry weapons, so that was the end of that. I uh, went back to the practice of law in 1990. I've been a lawyer doing trial work since 1990, and uh, both at Sleuth Sackerson and now at Gus Rosenfeld, where I do aviation law as well as other kinds of law. Mostly we defend people when they get sued, okay. including aviation companies and pilots and everybody else. Yeah, yeah. So I finally got a chance to check out the F-16. The 162nd out here gave me the chance. After flying a non-afterburning airplane for 15 years, it yeah. was absolute liberation to get in a jet and go straight to 30,000 feet. It was yeah. terrific. Yeah. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. I have a wife, Debbie Collins, whom I got to say, yeah. great lady, Debbie Munger Collins. We have two kids. Each of them have two children, so we have four grandkids. It's a great time. Right. You seem like such a great... I would have loved to have flown with you, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know uh, about that. Yeah. I, you know, the thing that's so important to today's generation is that they need people like you to look to to say, like, why did you work so hard to do that kind of stuff? Why did you put in a maximum effort? Because I'm sure you did. And the bird dog, when you did not want that, now you're in combat. It would have been easy for you to just drone. You know? There what, were guys who did that. Drove, what drove you? There were guys that did that. Um, if you don't face fear, you'll always be afraid of it. You'll always be afraid of it. So every time when I flew up to Anlock, I knew it was coming. And honestly, once you got there, there was no fear. But on the way up, there's always this recognition that people are going to be shooting at you every day. This right behind you is a, is a ZPU-4, which shoots 150 rounds a minute, which is not a big deal, except if you're only flying 150 knots, in which case it's a big deal. It has range up to 20,000 feet. We couldn't get above 10. So this thing was a big problem for us and a real major deal, not counting the SA-7s, which were effective up to 8,000 feet and made a real difference. We had to watch every second for an SA-7 coming. So, but on the way up, it was there. But there are people on the ground that really needed us, and there are people on the ground that, that required our commitment and our, our push and our best effort, and that's what we did. Same thing in the practice of law. There's no difference. You go to trial, it's just like firing a jet up and getting in the, and kicking the afterburner. It's exactly the same. When you do your opening statement, you've got to be 100% ready. You've got to be pushing. You've got to be working. You've got to be paying attention. But it's, it's the same thing. You asked a question of Newt Newtson, who was in here a moment ago, is what did you do when you talked to young pilots coming into your squadron for the first time? And I don't know if I'm anticipating yep, the question. Those are my other two. It's the same thing with jurors. You've got to look at them. You've got to pay attention to them. You've got to learn from them what they're doing, what they're thinking, what their motivations are. And then you got to guide them slowly so that they make the right decisions, not that you're dictating an answer to them. you got to guide them slowly so that they figure out what the right answer is. And I did that in the squadron in, in Saigon, really, because I was, at, for one time, uh, for a while, I was a QC pilot and a weapons guy. And then I was the weapons officer in Columbus for 10 years and a flight commander, and you have people come in all the time out of different regimes, out of F-4s, out of the Navy, out of, one guy had a, was a T-37 guy, a real slow trainer. He was absolutely raw. He never could learn how to strafe. He ended up being a two-star general, the number two guy at NORAD, because he was just that good. But he was terrible when he first showed up. He ended up being a great pilot. He was smart, he was paying attention, he was absorbing, but we had to learn from him from his eyes, from his actions, and from his performance in the air, what he was doing and what he needed to work on. And then, and then encourage him, number one, criticize him when necessary. If he's, not, if he's being lazy or if he's not being smart, you're not thinking, you get on him. And it's a hard debriefing. In the Air National Guard fighter squadrons in the 1970s, when you got down from a flight, there was a closed door meeting among the people in the flight, and it was brutal. If you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, you got a finger in your chest and you were told in no uncertain terms where you need to be from there on. Fighter squadrons are still kind of that way. Maybe not as direct as they used to be, but they're still pretty direct. When somebody just needs encouragement, 
and confidence, that's a whole different story. And that's what you get by reading them. It's the same thing with juries. You got to read the jurors' eyes. You got to read their notes as much as you can. As you can't read their notes, but you read the, those who are taking a lot of notes and those who aren't. The ones who fold their arms at the right time, the wrong time. The ones who are nodding when they should, and shaking their heads when they shouldn't. You got to read those people, and you got to then talk to them and lead them where you want them to go. So that's it. That's a great answer. And the other question that I had that I'm asking everybody is: You didn't become this person. Uh, by nameless people around you. You know, there are people who took an active interest in you becoming a great fighter pilot, a great pilot. Do you have a story of one mentor in particular who helped shape you, or, or in general terms, of how you were mentored to become the pilot you eventually became? Uh, there was a guy named Viper at the fighter squadron in, in Phoenix in the F-100s, John Varnum. He was a great guy, smart guy, and a very aggressive guy who, who pushed us, who pushed us. And then there was B.V. Johnson, who was the weapons guy, pushed us all the time, always aggressive, always pushing, always probing. Another guy named Harlow, who was the vice commander, he would, he would lead us on these formation rides. He'd pitch over and go down through the clouds, and we didn't follow him, man. It was trouble. It was real trouble. We ended up all alone going back in, and we knew we were getting in trouble when we got back. Um, I can't say that any one of those guys was better than another, but there are, there are some hard guys, tough guys along the way. Um, Gordon Campbell was a F-100 pilot with 5,000 hours who was a squadron commander when I got back to Columbus. Uh, great guy, smooth guy, a really good guy, smart man. I think probably the, 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 the single biggest guy was, Mark, was uh, Miles Durfee. Miles was a lawyer in Columbus when I met him. He was an F-100 pilot, one of the smoothest guys I ever flew with. Hard as a rock. He got me in as a prosecutor. Uh, I saw him doing prosecution. I saw him doing arguments in the Court of Appeals. Um, one of the really great guys. We buried him at Arlington last, uh, last October and uh, with honors. Ended up as a two-star general. He was chief of staff of the Ohio Air National Guard. Never fought in combat, but he was in, in for the show on 48 hour call for a lot of his time in the military. Um, and one of the great guys. Always told the truth, never backed down. That's where it is. Great, and my closing question, and this may be just a feeling more than direct statements on, on stuff is, what makes it so great to be an American fighter pilot? Putting an American flag on your flight suit and going out and doing the job. We don't kill people just for the hell of it. We kill people because they richly deserve it. They are attacking our forces. They're shooting at us. They are creating chaos in the world. And the United States, for as long as I've been around, stands up for freedom and stands up for people who are being oppressed. And that's what we did. That's for a better way to close <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I'd like to show you one thing, if I may. Yes. This was a, a rash pack, which we didn't wear because we didn't wear any patches in Vietnam. Uh, but that's what we wore was rash packs. But this is my proudest medal. This came from the 5th Arvin Regiment, which was located in Ann Locke. There were four of us who were given this award after the primary fighting was over, probably in September of 1972. They flew us up in helicopters uh, to Lai K, a base in the, uh, between Ann Locke and, and uh, Saigon. And this is an award made out of the top of a ration can in somebody's uniform, and it's awarded Superfac Rash 05. That was my call sign for the year. Anlock, 1972. You know what? It's priceless. So glad you remembered to. Uh...